There are bots galore. I mean, you, can, you know, bots seem to have taken over a lot of these sites. They're, oh wow, she's an attractive girl. I wonder how I get all those marketed to me. You know, and then I'll create another persona with a whole different digital exhaust, is what I call it, uh, of different collections. And all of a sudden, I'm getting targeted with, you know, 55 plus year old men for some reason. So, <laughs> you know, keep in mind as however we construct said identity as Lynn said. really dates them. <laughs> yeah. Um, as, as Lynn said, you know, it's very difficult to build an online identity, but I believe it is possible. I do believe with enough creativity and done, I believe it's possible for a confined period of time. It will ultimately. But, but actually, the flip side of that, you make a great point, is that what Robin Sage and other things show is that the due diligence that one might normally do, might, one might have done if you're dealing with paper records, somehow seems to vanish in, in cyberspace. Oh, 8,000 followers, must be, a good, must be a good person, so. It brings up a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of considerations in terms of what is trust, how do we validate that, what is real, I mean, what is even real? You have to ask yourself that question. When you see a YouTube video, does that mean it really happened? I mean, these things you have to consider. I'm not. I don't want to sound like Mel Gibson in the conspiracy theory movie, although I'm sure you most, most of you have written me off as, but um, it's really something you have to think about, uh, is what you're viewing and, oh, well, they went to school here, like the Robin Sage course. I mean, how do you really know that? Will we ever get to know that? It's, uh, it's, it's almost like the first time I got an email from a name I couldn't pronounce from Nigeria and told me I won $50 million and please contact me. <laughs> um, you know, you guys see those now and you're probably like, delete or move to spam and quarantine box. I assume that's the case. Well, how does that happen? How have you been conditioned to recognize that? And that is all as we continue to explore this digital realm, this digital environment, those things are almost second nature to us. But five years ago, you would have clicked on the respond or maybe, maybe opened up the email at least. So these are just things to consider. This is an evolutionary concept and we gotta keep asking questions. So I'll shut up so you guys can actually ask questions. One of the, uh, the other problems that, that recently has been posed is validating information. It's very easy for somebody to take a small piece of information, go out on the internet and amass this massive amount of facts that all seem related and present it to somebody who, having seen these for the first time, would say this is incontrovertible proof that this is happening. Uh, one of the uh, reporters I've known for years walked up to me last night in the hall and said, hey Andy, I, I saw you did something illegal, it was online. And I'm thinking like, well, wh what would that be? I don't remember anything recently, you know. I, I found on, online some crypto article, you know, uh, saying that I'm a spy for the IRS, and even though I was a special agent. Um, and they had all this information that was documenting the fact that I was a spy for the IRS. And it was almost good reading, except for the fact it was just totally false. And when we're dealing with informants, we have to be very careful, not only what they're telling us, but what position get, or, and how they were able to obtain that information. Was it firsthand? Was it bogus? Is it research? Because ultimately, if we take bad information and start working with it, we're wasting our time and endangering possibly other people in the process. So what they were alluding to with the data on the internet has actually become a problem because it is so easy to amass a pile of data that is absolutely meaningless, but when presented improperly, looks like it is. I would kind of like to know from the audience, what would you like us to talk about in specific? Because we're not getting a lot of questions. I would like to target you know, your, your issues. Anybody Just have any? pick one of them out and ask them, about, or Andy. <laughs> okay, you're close. What do you want to know? <laughs> Who, me? You want to know what, what the guy's name was online so you could date him. No, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Yes, sir. C can you get up to the microphone so we can hear you as well as them? Can you hear me? No, turn the can mic Can you hear me now? I can hear you All now. Right. <laughs> What I'm saying is that on the other hand, the internet is giving you the option of finding recruitments easily. You can use LinkedIn, for example, to find someone who's at a, sort of, at a specific position at the company you're targeting. So on the other hand, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's harder to, to insert a new recruitment because you have many electronic records, but on the other hand, you can easily find someone you're looking for and try to recruit it by email, 
by finding uh, its phone number, his phone number, and so forth. Okay, so when we're talking about recruitment, that, that's actually a very good point. Uh, that's a double-sided sword. In, in most cases, informants come forth and present data. It's not as common for law enforcement to go out seeking informants. They'll seek cooperatives or operatives, but not generally informants. For law enforcement, but what about military intelligence or CIA and such? Um, well, I'm not in the military, but perhaps... Uh, I'm sorry, what was... Can you kind of re-state uh, your question? I didn't hear it. Okay. Correct. I'm asking about how you can use the internet to recruit new, new, new people that can help you for humans. Right. For to become informants on military on, issues or intelligence. Side, yeah. yeah, that's a that's a question that I largely can't answer here. Um, <laughs> I, I would say though that I, I think that the construct is largely the same as you're recruiting somebody for a business position, right? How do you do that? What's your steps? I'm looking for a software dev guy that specializes in Ajax and has you know experience in this particular realm. How would I go about that process? Just as how, how would you go about your process if you wanted to recruit somebody to be an informant or something like that? I, I think you run the risk of not coming across as legitimate uh, at first, because put yourself in their shoes, right, you work for this agency. <laughs> um, I, I would say though that I'm not sure how what, what you know you, what your traditional background is, but the same rules that are used in the physical realm are used online. It's just the tools are different. So the, the fundamentals, this is my personal opinion, are the same. It's just what tools you use to to approach that person. Um, but I, I think the biggest consideration you should have in that is one of validating and vetting the individual. Um, and and at the end of the day. I also believe that you cannot purely have a virtual relationship, whether that's for business, whether that's for informant. At some point, I firmly believe you have to have a physical meeting. It might just be once, but I just think that as humans, we, we want to at least see the person, even if it's once. Yeah, but internet well, actually, tools what are you're, like LinkedIn. What you're alluding to, I, I think, is related to the uh, WikiLeaks phenomenon, mm -hmm. where you have uh, sites that actually recruit people or solicit people to submit information that they probably shouldn't or probably don't necessarily have the, the right to submit. And, you know, there's a couple ways that these kinds of sites promote that. Number one, they want to provide anonymity to the submitter. But interestingly enough, if any of you are wa uh, watch TED Talks, uh, the person that heads up WikiLeaks just did an interview there. And the interesting thing was that he kind of hit a, a chord with me. Anybody that submits information that comes from anywhere in the world, they won't publish it until they've validated it independently. So as you get into a mass market, when you start getting information, it's even more important than ever to be able to vet that information because any anonymous information, as, a, as for the most part, will have a zero value until it's, it's followed up on. Anonymity doesn't breed good information. Uh, generally, we want to know who we're talking to, and once again, all those you know, four W's. Who are you? Why are you here? What are you telling us? And what's your reason for telling us that? Mm -hmm. And once we can answer all those four things, then we can evaluate whether we have actual information or not. Yes, sir. So, um, it strikes me that uh, the combination of human and SIGINT would be really, really beneficial, but oftentimes that doesn't happen. I think there's a number of barriers to like technical analysis and SIGINT being combined with HUMINT from the fact that HUMINT and LES is usually pretty well protected, plus different communities, different people, they tend to distrust, if not completely dislike each other. Um, what would be kind of some suggestions you'd give that, that could kind of make that nexus work? Because uh, I think it's completely untapped. Thanks. So I think you're basically asking how do we validate information we don't necessarily have the ability individually to do it? Yeah, well, so I mean, a lot of times like signal intelligence or technical analysis will lead us to something that, that if we could combine it with human, would lead us to, to, to <coughs> a, a great piece of intelligence. Okay. By and that's actually, that's actually what I alluded to earlier, the trust groups. Yeah. One of the advantages of having a cadre of people is that the collective knowledge is much better than the, the sum of just the parts. So we have people in our groups that are 
very much into DNS. Somebody else is very much into BGP. Somebody else is really into you know, something else. What I spend most of my time doing is data mining, passive DNS, and spam trap data. Now I'm talking about up to 2.2 million links per five minutes of spam data and probably uh, 3,500 plus DNS connections every five minutes, or I'm sorry, every second. So we're dealing with massive amounts of data. But I still require the input from some of the antivirus people when they to tell me what is significant. I can find botnets just analyzing my data. It's trivially easy to find a, a fast flux botnet. A CV Wonder can find it with these kind of data sets. But what does that botnet do and how bad is it? So what will happen is in these groups we'll publish an email saying, gee, I just saw this botnet, it has, you know, 15 addresses, but if you look in the last 24 hours, we can identify over 500 IPs. You know, anybody have an idea what this does? And we'll put the link out there. And then the antivirus person will take his tool set, run it, and say, ah, oh, this is a packed whatever, it's doing this and it's going to here. And somebody else will jump on and say, ah, so it's really part of this uh, DDoS mechanism. We work in that area and this is what the CNC is, the command and control, telling this thing to do the DDoS that you just found that's the malware that disseminates it. So as a wide example, that's really what it takes. It, it, there is no one organization that can do it all, and we generally have found that when we work together, we, we're much more effective. Most of those relationships are very ad hoc and very unofficial. And the thing that I guess I'm getting at is, is to give you an example, um, some, some technical analysis will take a, a botnet and, and track it back to a region or an area. And oftentimes you'll have some LES group or, or some LES intelligence out there saying, hey, we picked up a laptop with this sort of information on it. And, and they're like this far apart, but they'll never talk. You know, either, you know, <laughs> the, the human's LES sensitive and so it's just never gonna go anyplace. And yeah, I, I spend most of my career avoiding working with the DOD because of the, the privacy or the, the classification. I always had a problem with when something happened, they would try and classify it. So if you had two offices in the Pentagon sitting next to each other, and both of them had the exact same computer and did the exact same thing, and one of them was compromised through some kind of exploit, they would classify it and essentially prevent that person from telling the guy next to him, hey, not for nothing, but like, patch this. Uh, I work in a very open environment, and that's what uh, I've thrived on. I was probably one of the very first law, federal law enforcement to actually take cases we had and put them out on the internet and say, this is what I got, can somebody help me with it? And when you start classifying things, you lose that ability. And the really sad part about all this is that every time you, you classify an offense, who are you really keeping it from? The bad guys know they did it, they did it. So why are we keeping this from others? You know, it's been a problem and DOD is notorious for doing that. Maybe Dr. Wells would like to just talk about that. <laughs> the It just seems to me that the the diversity of information that you, you can bring to bear on a problem now uh, just gives you a completely I was listening to somebody today talking about the New York Times being uh, all the news that uh, all the news that's uh, fit to print. Somebody says the model of the news right now is um, uh, we try to get it right sooner. And the point being, what happens right now is you put out a story quickly and nobody cares much about the initial accuracy. And the way you get accuracy is kind of asymptotically uh, weeding out all the, uh, the, all the bad information, which is